Hey, good morning, church. How's good everybody morning. today? Good morning. You awake? Oh. Wow. Wow. I'm not, we're not awake. <laughs> yeah, so am I. Holy yeah, cow. Well, isn't this a great brisk day inside the house? <laughs> it was kind of nice last night because Russ Swart, who uh, is the manager of the property here for the landlord, he came to the movie last night, so he uh, he kept his jacket on all night long. Too, so. so he knows that lack of heat is a real thing, boy. But it, uh, we're up to 60 degrees now. So when I came in and kicked down the heaters this morning, it was a brisk 49 in here. So it was uh, pretty cold. So uh, got to get a hold of the heating people tomorrow and make sure they get out here and get us taken care of. But it is a great day nonetheless. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, right? <laughs> you can't be that cold. So we had a great movie last night. Had a really good turnout for that. Uh, Christmas with a capital C kind of kicks off our Advent season in here. Going to tie into the uh, next series that we have going in here for Advent. Our study is the Advent Conspiracy to Worshipfully Spend Less give more and love all. So uh, it's kind of a way to take a, a step back at Christmas and it ties right into kind of what the movie went through last night. It's making sure that we're not just getting caught up in the stuff of Christmas, but that we're actually living out Christmas. Christ's message on earth for everyone is to be sanctified, to walk in Christ's shoes as we go through our daily walk. And so we're going to learn how to substitute consumption for compassion. And we're going to practice those four simple, powerful, powerful, but yet countercultural, which means we're kind of going against what society is doing out there as a whole today. Those concepts, we want to worship fully because Christmas starts and ends with Jesus. And that's key. That's Christ Mass. It's a gathering for Christ. That's what Christmas is all about. We want to spend less free resources for things that really truly matter in your life. Not just buying something because you feel obligated to give something off to somebody. That's not what Christmas is about. It is about giving. Giving more of your presence, your hands, your words, your time, your heart to do things that really matter in life. Not just spending to spend and giving to give. And then loving all, the poor, the forgotten, the marginalized people, the sick, and always making sure that we can make a difference. And we've got a whole uh, synopsis of this uh, kind of on our website. So if you want to go to Grace Creek Church slash Advent Conspiracy Series, we'll come to that again. Uh, then you can read through that synopsis, but better yet, join us starting next Sunday for the Sunday series and the Wednesday study series as well. So it, it should be a really, really good series. Next, up on our list of good things coming on, mark your calendar as well. The men's breakfast is going to be right here. Uh, biscuits and gravy will be on tap. So um, we will have biscuits and gravy and eggs, egg casserole and all kinds of good food company, coffee, juice. That's going to be 9 a.m. on December 3rd. So make sure you, you come around. Please feel free to invite anyone you'd like to invite. All are welcome. And then following up the next Saturday, then will be Christmas caroling on December 10th. And so we're planning on making up some crocs of chili and things like that, hot cocoa and coming in, dropping them off here, and then going out and doing our caroling uh, out there to the care centers and some of the shut-ins and people like that. Um, so please make sure you stop by for that. It should be a good time. It's always a great time when we can gather together here as a family in Christ. Uh, I always look forward to it, whether it's on Sunday, Wednesdays, or whenever we're doing our fun stuff in here too. So 
That leads us up then to the Christmas Eve candlelight service, which is going to be at 11 p.m. on Christmas Eve. And then there will be no Christmas morning service because we're going to be here till about midnight. So that kind of counts as our Sunday service. And that way you can spend Christmas Day with your families. Fun times coming up again. Our next movie night, believe it or not, we have another one of those coming up here in January. Right away, God's Not Dead, We the People. So God's Not Dead, number four. And uh, that should be a good time. Terry announced last night that they're in production on God's Not Dead 5 now. So uh, we kind of go through the series. It seems almost like it's Rocky or something. It's the Rocky of Christian movies. But it's a really, really good series. It's a really good message and a good theme that they're following through with. And again, it kind of followed somewhat of what they were doing last night. And last night's movie is We the People. So they're kind of following some of those things as well. And then Orange Track begins its 18th season February 11th already. We're already looking ahead to February in here. So a lot of good things coming up, a lot of fun things on the schedule for us to do. And as always, uh, for those who are online, we have a link that Terry's going to post up for you here in a moment. And that will be for all of the songs that we are going to play at the end of our service so you can join right in with those. So let's go to God in prayer and open up this time of worship. Father God, we just praise you and thank you for this opportunity to gather here together as a family of God, as your family and here, brothers and sisters in Christ, gathered together in your name to worship you and to bring honor and glory to you, Lord. We praise you and thank you for this opportunity to gather freely and openly here. And Lord, we just ask today that you would send your Holy Spirit upon us, open our ears to hear, our hearts to receive your message and for us to be able to live that message out day by day. Open our eyes to all the wonders and blessings that you give us in our life each and every day. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful life that you've given us, the opportunity to be here together as family. So Lord, as, as we uh, send some special blessings on Pastor Terry this morning as he gives that message, Lord, we just ask that you would just empower him with your spirit, that he would be bold in his testimony before us today and the message that you have given him. And we praise you and thank you in all these things. In Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. So today's call to worship, uh, Pastor Terry picked out, comes from 1 Timothy 6, 6 from the New Living Translation. And it says, Yet true godliness with contentment it's, it is itself great wealth. That's kind of a tongue twister if you can try and go through it a little bit. But true godliness, that means if we are truly following what God wants us to do in our lives, then that contentment is a great wealth. It means it's worth more than all the money in the world. If we follow God and, and we follow that, he will give us those blessings that bring contentment. And as we think about that, uh, this message calls out to me to have stewardship. Be a good steward of the blessings that God gives to us. Be a good steward in these times. So in this in this season of overindulgence and spending and everything that, that has become the societal norm in, today, in today's culture, we take a look at this and it, and it kind of brings us back and grounds us in what God really wants from us. What does God want out of Christmas? It is a celebration of what? The birth of Christ, right? His son, him bringing his son, bringing salvation to us in the form of his son. And that's truly what we need to be thankful for. So thankfulness for a stewardship lifestyle that we can take on as we follow Christ in our walking with him. And that's what I was talking about last week when, when we had, when I was talking about sanctification, being able to walk in Christ's footsteps as he justified us with grace and forgave us of our sins. So as we enter into this week of Thanksgiving, it's a time for us to reflect on all the good things that God has provided us with. Not necessarily everything we wanted, but really, truly, God gives us what we need to fulfill his purpose here on earth. See, we always kind of have that conflict going on. 
So if we want to be content with things, we have to be content with what God is providing us with, what we need, not necessarily everything we want. So in today's society, it's become kind of this race for wealth. And if you don't have the correct measure of wealth, then you are minimalized by society. You're marginalized and you're not good enough. And, you know, the keeping up with the Joneses and all those kind of things that come along with that of looking at material <coughs> wealth as being a sign of who you are. And that's not truly what God wants. Because wealth threatens our spiritual life. Persons that are caught up in the get-rich drive, you know, that get-rich-quick scheme, find that while money itself is not evil, the love of money is evil. And it brings on evil and brings evil into your life. Most of the people that have a lot of that kind of money truly don't have the happiness that comes that they thought it was going to buy them. Because you truly can't buy happiness. So accumulating wealth in, in some people's lives, um, it, it becomes their God. And it becomes what they focus their life on. And so they, they worship money. And accumulating wealth gets their top priority in their lives. And money is seen as their only source of security. But those who seek that lifestyle are always left wanting more. It becomes an insatiable urge that they have to have more. When is enough enough? When is being thankful and content with what you have enough? And that's what I was talking about earlier, that God gives us what we need, not necessarily everything we want. And that's called contentment. And that, I think, is what we really need to focus on this week. Thankfulness and godly contentment is our desired alternative to that grasp for the money, the go for the money. I, I can't tell you how many stories I read about this last uh, go with uh, the lottery that was out there, this massive, two, what was it, $2 billion I did it or something like that? <coughs> $1.9 billion. And people were literally emptying their bank accounts to go out and buy a lottery ticket. They had a one in... 300 billion chance of winning. You might as well just take all that money on your account and just throw it out the window as you're driving down the road. You had a better chance of winning. Yeah. And they, they lose sight of that money is not the solution. Money is not the answer. But as people are trying to find contentment in their lives, they want that satisfaction. They want that fulfillment in their lives. They need to be thankful for what God gives them. So I came up with three guidelines that help Christians seek contentment and keep money in its place during this season. Number one, I like this one, this is my favorite. We brought nothing into this world and we'll take nothing out of this world. We have to have that concept down. We didn't bring anything into it, we're not gonna take anything out of it. You can amass all the wealth you want, but guess what, it stays in place. Do not store for yourself treasures here on earth where thieves and moths can, thieves can steal and moths can destroy and rust can destroy. Seek instead your treasures in heaven. That will bring you true contentment. Number two, God gives the power to acquire money. Hmm, how about that? He's going to give us what we need when we need it. So if he sees that we're truly in need of something, he will provide the means to get what we need. Not necessarily what we want. We've got to keep the two of those separated. Money, number three, money should be used to serve God and others. We need to be good stewards, again, of what God has provided for us. And that doesn't just go with cash. That's our jobs, our family, our church, our church friends, our self-worth. Those things are actually worth more than all the cash in the world. Things we can use in life that will last in eternity. Gracious Lord, help us open our hearts to this message today and to receive it and to accept it and to bless Pastor Terry as he gives us his words today. In your precious name. Amen. Mm -hmm. I almost want to take your suggestion. We'll just preach from over here. <laughs> 
it, it's actually going up a little bit. We put some bands in the room. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I can move that band to work, cool you down there. Well, and, and this leads into this. So, Those aren't so bad right now. <laughs> when, when I sent the, uh, the message to, to Mark, it, it was not thankful in all circumstances. It was content in all our circumstances. And I'm actually quite content right now. I'm very thankful that, you know, this isn't just a, a nice little article that makes the room look nice. It's actually got a heater and there's another one back there. But it's, it's warming up in here. And I'm thankful we have a space where we can come and worship together. Mm -hmm. I'm thankful that we have the technology that we can share this with people online. And I know there are people that are not that are watching here in Cedar Rapids, but there are people that are watching right now that aren't in Cedar Rapids. So I'm very thankful in this circumstance. And, and I know that um, as I'm getting warmer, Diane's probably getting colder because we're exact opposites. But it's so easy to look at a circumstance like this and go, oh, man, it's cold. You know, and just, just get upset and get uh, down on it. And, but no, we don't have to. And this is a screen grab of a video I was going to have playing behind the words. It was just a, uh, a, a, rain, a rainstorm. But then I got into that video about two or three minutes and it put a big copyright and, and you can't play it without their permission so I took a screen grab and it, it's literally a 10 hour video and that's designed for people to sleep by so you can play it to sleep so even though I can play all that I'm thankful that I can take a screen grab of it so that it's just how you pers your perspective and and looking at things now we're coming up on uh, Thanksgiving, our next big holiday. Thanksgiving brings with it a rush of all kinds of emotions. For some it's, yay, I get to see family, and for some it's, you know, I gotta go see family. But think back to previous, you know, gatherings, and, and the one that I always remember is when my brother and I were small, um, there was always that abundance of food. I, I grew up in a we're half Dutch, half Swedish. So there was always lots of food. And I was always thankful for my brother because all he ate was mashed potatoes and rolls. That left everything else for us. Now, that didn't include the drinks because he would drink all the milk or he'd drink a bunch of water. And he was, so he was never really very hungry and that's why he only ate a little bit. But in that moment, as you know, and I'm only what eight, ten years old, I'm thankful that he eats the way that he does because we had more. And the thing is, is that as I was thinking about that, I, I thought, you know, we have to admit that are we like that with God? Can we be like what my brother was with the food with God? Do we pick and choose what we want from God? Do we make God a buffet or, or as some call it a smorgasbord? Say that three times real fast. But here's the thing, when we pick and choose, this leads to leaving so much on the table, untouched. So often in life we hear people who are discontent about this or they're grumbling about that or they're complaining about this there's just this general lack of gratitude. You know, Diane and I have made it a point when we go out, we, as soon as that waiter or waitress comes to the table, if we're in a sit down restaurant, we're just, we try to overflow with them. And the young lady we had on our anniversary here this past week, she, I tell you, I think she's talked more to us than she did to anybody else. She even gave us some stories about when she first came to the country seven years ago. And it was just so joyful. She was just overflowing with joy. But when she went to the other tables, I watched her. And it was just, a, they weren't the same with her. So it was just, let me get your order, let me get your drinks. 
It was a very different attitude because of how they treated her. So this is something that I pray would change during this season of Thanksgiving, that we would hear less discontentment, less grumbling, complaining, and those things. And I gotta wonder, and I'm gonna wonder aloud because you know I'm standing up here talking, so I have to do that. What would our world look like if everyone was satisfied with what they had and where they were at in their lives? What if we were satisfied? What if we had a world of contentment? In 1 Timothy 6, Paul is warning Timothy to stay away from those who are in ministry just to make money. And I guarantee you that is not us. We don't take a dime. I, and he is also warning against those who had strayed away from biblical teaching, which is not us. And those that were using the scriptures to lord over others for personal gain, and I'll say it again, that is not us. We don't bring the message that way. We don't do ministry that way. It is not about us. Let's get into that, and, and this that's kind of leading into this passage from uh, chapter 6, 6 and 8, where it says this, Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into this world, and we, can take, we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. We have a church text chat. And this week, a call came out to help for things needed at the overflow shelter here in Cedar Rapids. And this is something that we can do throughout this season. And, and Doug, thank you for putting that out there. We now have some things that are in that room. There's some stuff over here by the, the, uh, the coats. And I know there's folks that want to bring more. And therefore, we can go out because we have enough, we can give to others. This is a difference that we can make in people's lives. And it's so difficult for those who don't believe to understand how we can find our contentment and our thanksgiving and our thankfulness that our needs are met by Christ. And there's a big difference between wants and needs. Now for some, a warm blanket is a need and it's also a want. Don't get me wrong there, and we are going to try to help make that happen as best that we can. But the things that we want can lead to anxiety and can lead to discontentment. At one time, I wanted a car like Mark has that goes really fast, not the Mini Cooper. <laughs> but I'm content with what I have because here's the thing. If I had a car like that, children, I'd also have a big folder of tickets. <laughs> and then I'd be broke and have an upset wife. There would be no contentment in the home. So... It's perspective. There's a perspective behind it as well. But it's so easy to think that if I just had a little bit more, I could be content. That's why people, as Mark was talking about the lottery, were out buying tickets in drugs. I had to run into Casey's here when it was, I think, 1.6. And the guy in front of me, he bought like a pop, and then he got $60 worth of tickets. Okay, um, in all honesty, I bought two. I spent a couple bucks, or four bucks. Because, you know, what, you know what, what can we do with the church with that kind of money, right? <laughs> but it's not something that we do on the regular. It's, not, it's just kind of a more of a novelty. We have enough. But... How many of us think, if I just could get to this point, then I will do this? I remember when I was working at Hardy's years and years ago, and I was a manager, and I had 
I had an awful habit, it was called smoking, and I said, boy, if I get promoted to manager, I'm going to quit, because then I'll be content, I won't need, yeah, no, that didn't happen either. It's so easy to get to that point, we just never have enough, and we keep wanting more and more and more, and without peace and contentment in our lives, that peace and contentment that we get from Jesus, we just want more and more. And guess what? More and more leads to temptation. You become tempted to do more and more things. First Timothy 6, 9 and 10, just right after that first passage, says this. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil and some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. It's interesting on Wednesday night we were talking about a couple of different people that uh, some folks knew in their lives who have plenty but yet live extremely humble lives and are very giving. And that is a joy to hear about because so often we hear a completely different story. People crave what they want, which is often more than just money. There's so much, but money doesn't bring happiness. Never will, never has. And the sad thing is that too many fall into a temptation, as Paul writes, because they are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires. I want a bigger house. I want a faster car, I want a, a nicer car. I can't even imagine spending the money that some people do on their cars. You know, some of those cars are upwards of 100 to 150 and beyond. Thousand dollars. Not, not hundred dollars. Right. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it's it just becomes a vicious cycle with the only end in in line there is destruction. So here we can thank Paul for giving us some guidelines to, to live by. He, he, breaking these down, we must realize that someday all that money will be gone. We won't have it. I mean, the folks that, that in the early 1900s, they saw that happen in, during the Great Depression. They lost all their money. We need to be content with what we have. Philippians 4, 11 and 13 says this, now, not that I have, was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Is what you're going to do for more in line with what God has for us? We have to love God. And we're back to those these guidelines from Paul. We have to love God more than money. We have to love people more than money. And we have to share with others what we have. And like Paul, we can choose to be content with what we have. He was very content sitting in a dungeon. And we talked about what some of those dungeons looked like. Literally like sitting in a sewer. That was some of the conditions that he would be held in. Yet he was full of Christ. Therefore he was content with what he had. Shortly after my first marriage ended, I moved into an efficiency apartment. An apartment that was behind Mercy on 5th. And if you're from Cedar Rapids and remember those before they got torn down by Mercy, they were not in the best part of town. But it fit my need. I was content. I had a bed. It was efficiency, so it was all basically one room in an L shape. I had a little wooden screen. I had my living room with a TV and a couch, and I had a, and a kitchen with some pots and some pans and some dishes. And a, uh, I don't even believe I had a table to sit at. I just sat on the couch. I was content. I had all that I needed. Now we have a three-bedroom home. 
that is packed to the gills with stuff. And I don't have that same contentment. I don't want that stuff gone. We want to purge that stuff because we have decades of stuff. You ever notice that you move into a place and all of a sudden, just a few years later, you have more and you don't even know how you got it? It just ends up being there. And we don't have a desire to have more anymore. We have a desire to be content with what God gave us and to get rid of that other stuff. So let's let's go ahead and venture back to where Paul was when he was writing the letters. Again, he is in jail. He is being held there, and a Roman guard is likely standing outside the door. You know, they had plenty of guards, so let's put one outside Paul's door. Yet he is thankful, and he's writing a letter to the church of Philippi to, to do what? To not complain about his circumstance, but to encourage them further. He was wanting to help strengthen their faith in light of all the difficulties, not, not that he was facing, but that they were facing. He wanted them to be just as thankful and content as he was. And he's in this awful, awful situation. Now, if it were most people, they would have been sitting where Paul was and they would have been anxious and frustrated and discontent and upset. And you probably think of any number of other emotions that probably went, would go through. But Paul started writing this letter with thanksgiving and prayer. So let's back up to chapter 1. Look at verses 3 and 4 where he says, Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy. He understands that God's plan and calling on his life is so much bigger than himself. And then a little bit later in chapter 1 and verse 20 and 21, he says, For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or die. For to me, living means living for Christ and dying is even better. For those who don't know God, life is what it is. It's good, it's bad, it's indifferent, it just is. There's no hope. So it's natural that they want to pursue all the things of the world. They want to go after the money. They want to go after popularity. popularity. They want to go after power, pleasure, prestige. They want all of that. Yet we need to learn to be content. So let's talk about first what contentment is not. Contentment is, is not complacency. Complacency is dangerous because it means we're not growing in our faith. And as Christians, complacency will hinder our time with God. I used to work similar hours that I ended years ago, and in order to not be complacent, in order to make sure that I'm spending time with God, I would get up at 3.30 in the morning just to get my reading done so that I could get dressed and get to work by 6.00. We don't need complacency. We also uh, can identify that contentment is not ignorance, because ignorance is born out of complacency. These are all going to be connected to one another. It, it's a lack of knowledge and or understanding, leaving us unaware and uninformed, which if we are complacent, we're not spending time with God, therefore we are not finding out what he wants. Complacency also is not inconsiderate, because if we could read through the scriptures, any number of places that it tells us that we should not be inconsiderate or selfish. It also is not isolating yourself in some activity. And I think of kids today who sit behind their little games and they're sitting there gaming. When I remember as a kid, and y'all, most of you can relate to this, you went out at when the, the sun came up and you came home and the lights came on in the street. And there's many memes on social media about this and lots of things about that. You ate lunch, 
maybe if one of the neighbors or one of your friend's parents bought something for you. <laughs> we just went and we were gone all day. And we were constantly moving and we were constantly with our friends. Um, just ha recently had a, a friend that I had as a kid friend me on Facebook. And he made a comment, you remember when we did this? And it was like, yeah, we were always with others. We were not holed up. So isolating ourselves is not a good thing. Proverbs 18, one in the um, ESV version says this, whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. This is what discontentment is, is what contentment is not. There's a story that goes like this. It says, it's 8 a.m., there's a knock on the door, and a guy gives you $100. You ask, why are you giving this to me? And he replies, I just want you to share it. That evening, you're telling some, everyone. Next day at 8 a.m., there's the same guy knocking on your door and handing you $100. And this happens day after day after day for three weeks. At this point, what is happening? At 8 a.m., where are you? Not sitting on the couch, not at the kitchen table, having a cup of coffee and eating your breakfast. You're standing and you're expectant. You're waiting at the door. Well, by the seventh week, you're not even doing that. What have you done? You scribbled a note, you put it in an envelope, and you left it taped to the door for them. Please insert money into envelope. Now, the next day, what happens? There's no money in the envelope. Okay, so the next day, you are at the door waiting, and, and here's what happens. The guy walked past your place and went to the neighbor's house. And you yell out to him, hey, he doesn't deserve that. What are you giving him the money for? And eventually you become angry and resentful that you are no longer getting something you didn't deserve in the first place. Something you took for granted. In the beginning, the sense of privilege was very high, but it, over time it diminished and you stopped being thankful and became susceptible to discontent. Now, we can all relate that to something in our lives where we start off really super happy with something and then we became discontent with it. And just as much, how, how often in our lives do we find it very easy to gripe and complain about something? Now, oftentimes people will switch jobs because they don't like all the garbage that's happening in their job. Well, I hate to tell you this, but I've never had a job where someone wasn't complaining and griping about something. It happens everywhere. The grass is not grass necessarily greener on the other side. But what's worse yet is while that person is griping and complaining about it, someone else brings over the proverbial can of gas and pours it onto that fire and just fuels it. Now, that's the workplace. Let's think about our personal life. Who's your favorite team? Doesn't matter the sport, who's your favorite team? Now, how often do you hear people complain about the way they are playing or the way they are being coached? Now, we have a local team that wasn't doing so good at the beginning of the year, and everybody was complaining about one of the players and one of the coaches. Now they're winning. People are still complaining about those two, but there's always something to complain about, something to gripe about. I swear sometimes it seems like people aren't happy unless they got something to complain about. I'm sure this is something that Paul had to learn. Because if we think about it, before his encounter with Jesus, he was one of those religious leaders. He probably had some money. He had a nice place to live. Life was going pretty good other than those darn Christians. Yeah, 
Then he encountered Jesus. And he went from all that to pretty much nothing living a life of persecution. In verse 11, he tells us that we need to be content with what we have. He was. This happened despite the troubles he experienced. Paul had contentment no matter what was on his plate. So we can be thankful no matter what's on our plate. Now there will be times when God puts things on your plate that you might not like. And he has a bigger plan for you he knows better than we do, even though we might not think so. But I'm reminded of when we used to serve with the youth group down at First Presbyterian downtown. The kids would be serving the meal, and they were thinking, wow, this is a really nice meal to serve these people, but what would happen? Just like the guy that was getting that 100 bucks every day, the people that were coming all the time, some of them were grateful, don't get me wrong. Some of them, there were a few, do you have anything else? I don't like that. It's not that I can't eat that because of an allergy or something. I don't like that. I'm sorry. If I was in that situation, I don't like green peppers and some things either, but I'm going to eat it because I don't have anything. Back when I was in high school, I went to, to France on an exchange my family was awesome. Don't get me wrong, but she served grapefruit juice for breakfast, and one night we had sausage and sauerkraut. I drank the grapefruit juice, and I ate the sauerkraut. I did not. I didn't care for either. And I choked down that, that grapefruit juice with a smile on my face and said, thank you. But I'm, I'm a long way from home. And this is what was put before me. My mom always said, eat what you're given. Well, sometimes life is like a large glass of grapefruit juice. You might not like it, but you drink it anyway. Sometimes it's like that big plate of sauerkraut. You may not have liked it at first. Now I love sauerkraut. Granted, I have to cook it on the side burner of the grill because Diane doesn't like the smell in the house and she doesn't like sauerkraut either. But and parents, you're going to know what I'm talking about this next thing. Did anyone else grow up being told, you'll eat what I made or you go to bed hungry? Or some version of that? That doesn't happen today. Oh, I'm sorry you didn't like what I made. Let me make you some. No. No, just let me eat what's there. Because we do that with God. It boils down to the fact that no matter what is on our plate, we can find contentment. We can be thankful. Let's be thankful that there's food. Be thankful that we have someone who cares enough for us that they made us something. But the problem is, is that people just aren't happy sometimes, like I mentioned before, unless they're miserable. And this is because we live in a fallen world. It's, it's the why people are the way they are. It explains why people stay in bad situations, whether they're at work or at home. In verse 12, Paul tells us that he has learned to live with nothing and with everything. He learned to be content. The next verse has been comforting and encouraging to many, but it also goes back to that precursor to this, this passage, that false teachers have taken this scripture and misinterpreted it or misunderstood it and said it incorrectly and taught it incorrectly. Where it says, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. This is not about putting on a cape and becoming superhuman and, you know, being a superhero. This is not DC Comics or Marvel. We can learn from this verse is that like Paul, we are able to face all of our circumstances with thanksgiving, thanksgiving and contentment. 
it's so easy to look at life and be discontent, to be unthankful. 35 years ago, I was diagnosed with sleep apnea. Doctor at the time said, this is a life affecting issue. You could die from this. And what did the insurance company say? Nah, it's not that big deal. I would wait 10 years before anybody would do anything. And then I'd get this CPAP that I was intolerant with. Now, as for some, my dad, CPAP works great for him. Mark has a BiPAP, works great for him. I go to the sleep study, you know, and I roll when I sleep, but so at home I was getting wrapped up in it. But at the sleep study, I would lay flat on my back the whole night. For whatever reason, I was just, and they tried both CPAP and BiPAP. My head wouldn't even move. And they could see that I couldn't tolerate either. 20 years after they finally decided they would do something about it, science comes up. And I gotta thank God for giving somebody the brains to do this. This little device that's implanted in my chest that allows me to feel, have the knowledge that I'm not gonna be okay and I don't have to worry about almost dying every night. But even in that moment, or in those moments where I thought I was could potentially die every night, I was content with life. God had given me that contentment, so that thanksgiving. It was about knowing that God would get me through it and get me out of it. Paul was able to get through it because he was looking at life through God's eyes. And I, I believe that there are many people who are ready for a change. And they're looking. They're seeking out what can help them. And I think as a ministry, that's that's one of the things that we are aspiring to do. And I, and I truly believe that we are on the way to doing that. We're seeing people through the different ministries that we have. Whether it was the movie night last night, or the one that's coming up, or the ones that we've had in the past, or whether that's Orange Track, whether that's the men's breakfast, whatever it is, caroling, we're seeing changed lives. So what is on your plate may not change. As you grow deeper in your faith, what changes is you and how you see what is on your plate. I know Mark and I both said this, let go and let God. Having Jesus is enough. So much so that we need to be thankful. Because whether you are going through something right now, whether you've been through something in the past, whether there's something coming in the future, whether you are alive or not, like Paul said, boy, I, I don't know if I want to be alive or not because being dead means I'm with Jesus and how much better will that be? But have any of you ever read or seen any of the Left Behind movies? We went through that with some kids once, the, the children's or the kids' versions of those books. And I got to wondering, I wonder. Do I want to get left behind so that I can reach those people that are still here? How's that for a weird view on that? When I could go and be with Jesus you know, in, in the sense of those books. So whatever we're going through, whatever we have coming uh, happening in our lives, we need to be thankful. So what I would like to do is close this with a song. And I want it to be our prayer today and every day. And part of that psalm is up here. It might be a little hard to read. This is verses 4 and 5, but I'm going to read the whole psalm as our, our prayer today. Shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter 
his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name for the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever and his faithfulness continues to each generation. Thank you, Pastor Curry. As we come into this time of communion, we have a lot of things to be thankful for. Over the last few weeks, we've talked about several things that God has done and put into our lives. We've talked about uh, how God has reached out to us and given us a gift of being justified through His grace, through His mercy, being saved without earning it, without deserving it, and how good and how we should be thankful for those blessings that God has done for us, brought us out of who we were, brought us out of what we've done, and given us freedom, given us salvation, given us a life everlasting in and through Him. And so as we come into this time of communion today, it's a time for us to join together and to remember. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of that salvation. Do that in remembrance of the justification of the life I brought you out of. Be thankful for being freed from our sin and death through Christ. On the night that he was betrayed... He took bread and he broke it and he said, This is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat. Later on in the meal, he took the cup and after he filled it, he blessed the cup and he said, This is the cup, my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This is the new covenant that I make with you. And then he gave us the lasting thought that each time that we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we are to do it in remembrance of Him. Being thankful for that salvation. Remembering to bring praise, honor, and glory to God in all that we do. And all that we say in all of our lives. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Oh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I'm thankful for Grace Street Church. It's a beautiful place to be in the morning on Sunday and on Wednesday nights and and uh, to have uh, just uh, time to spend with friends and family. And so I'm very grateful. Whether cold or hot, <laughs> it's a little chilly, but I'm glad we're here. So it's time for prayers for the people. And is there anyone specific that we would ask for prayer for this morning? Or I have some prayers. I'm just going to continue. So all right, then let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we come to you thanking you this morning for always being there for us in times of uncertainty, of troubles, loss, pain, and suffering. For in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6 and 9, for God said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Therefore, we praise and honor you first and foremost above all things, for you are our creator, our deliverer, our forever help in times of trouble our tower of refuge to which we turn to pray, turn in prayer to guide us through this life. We delight in you today 
and ask that your Holy Spirit dwell within each and every one of us, Lord Jesus. I pray for Atlas and Kim's family and extended family. Whatever issues they are facing, I pray that you are in the midst to guide them through the darkness and shine your light upon them and bring peace and comfort and joy to their hearts as only you can. Father God, <clears throat> I lift up Lori's friend Sharon and son Chad and my friend Katie and her daughter Allison. Their children are having severe health issues. I pray, Father God, that you will guide the doctors, give them wisdom on how to help these children to recover, to live normal and healthy lives, knowing that you heal them. Comfort and strengthen the parents, help them to find you through the darkness and be their beacon of light and hope for the future. Guide them through this trial, Lord Jesus. Father God, I lift up my friends, Chris and Jerry, to you today. They're both fighting sinus issues and pneumonia. I pray for healing and restoration, for healthy bodies, for your presence to be with them and heal them completely. I pray for the homeless, Lord. Guide them and place to give them shelter where they can be fed and get rest and strength for their bodies in these cold temperatures. Feed them with your word and living water. Restore them back to health, Lord Jesus. And then also, Lord, I'd like to pray for Carla's friend, John, who needs a heart transplant, but because of tumors in his body, he has um, been taken off the list. Father, he is in desperate need of your help, Lord Jesus, for his body is weak. Help him to lean on you for strength and comfort. Guide him in this time in his life. We thank you today for John's life and ask for comfort and peace for the days that lie ahead. We praise you and we honor you, Father, Father God, and we thank you for everyone here today and online with us. And we thank you for Grace, our Grace Street Church and family, our, our pastors Mark and Terry and their wives Lori and Diane. And may the grace of God rest upon this church and all the people that are here. In Jesus' holy name. We are truly blessed as a ministry to have people who are gifted, whether it's in serving, whether it's in prayer. Thank you, Denise. People who are gifted to do different things within the ministry. And I thank God for that. It's not just about being content. That is an overflowing joy that I'm so thankful for. So as we close this portion of our service, the online portion, I just ask a rhetorical question of you all to think about. What are the things in your life that you're not only content with, but you are so thankful for? Father God, we are so grateful that we have an opportunity to have a relationship with you. Thank you for not only blessing us with your presence, but for wanting good things for us. Father, thank you for waiting on us patiently, whether we are in a point in our life where maybe we don't believe or we're wandering in our desert path. But in this time for us right now, Father, we are honored to serve you. And I pray that all that we do will bring glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.